What do the cloud and a walled garden have in common? Coming up on the Prolifics Innovation Sandbox, we'll have the answer to that question and an exploration into a new approach to the cloud. We're live in 30 seconds, so grab your shovel and let's go innovate. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Prolifics Innovation Sandbox. I'm your host, Kirsten Kraft. Today, we're talking about a new way to think about the cloud. Brianna Frank, Director of Product Management for the IBM Cloud, she's with us here today to talk about this new approach. Then we'll be joined by the prolific CTO, Greg Hutchkinson, to add his perspective for how that approach applies in real situations. As always, make sure that you type your questions in the live chat. It's going to be on the right or the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for Q&A with both guests at the end of today's show. So let's get started. Brianna Frank, welcome to the Prolifics Innovation Sandbox. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. And Prolifics has been an amazing partner for IBM and especially for our new product, IBM Cloud Satellite. So I'm very excited to be here. Now, Brianna, before we talk about the cloud, I want to talk about you for just a minute. You are in a very fast moving division of IBM. So tell us a little bit about what you do and, and how you got there. What a journey. And I'll tell you, you know, it's interesting how um, I actually do not have a traditional um, technology background, but technology jobs have just pulled me in. And I don't think I've ever had a job that wasn't technology oriented. And I think that's what, you know, one, the market is really, you know, drawing me in, but also I think I just have a real interest in emerging tech. And so wherever I go, whatever I, whatever I do, that seems to either I follow it or it follows me. And so that's really where I'm interested in is, you know, solving new problems, listening to my clients and users and figuring out how I can, you know, solve problems with the latest and greatest technology. And, you know, I work really hand in hand with my design and development teams. Um, I'm a really strong believer in design thinking um, and the three in a box um, methods. Um, we have a great, amazing relationship between the three groups. And I think that that, um, and I think it's also a quest for problem solving. You know, you hear a problem that a client might be facing and you think, okay, how can I solve this? And I think if you have the right mix of skills and everybody's coming to the table with, you know, a different set of unique, you know, um, capabilities or unique um, aspects of their personality and skills, I think that that's what makes a great team. And then that's what makes great products. And I think I'm very, I feel very fortunate to be on a team where everyone really compliments one another and they're really respectful for each, each other's talents. And I think that breeds great results. So that's a little bit about me. And I've been in product for about four or five years now, and I absolutely love it. It's definitely probably where I will keep my career. Um, as, you know, as long as I'm working in technology, I want to build, I want to build new and fun things. So let's talk a little bit about those new and fun things that you talked about. This, this new approach that I keep referring to, it's a concept called distributed cloud. And it's a market concept. It's not an IBM thing. Can you talk a little bit about that concept and, and how it emerged? Absolutely. Um, the first time I heard it was actually Gartner. I think Gartner is uh, really coined the term. And we really embraced it because I think it really um, is a great way. It kind of encapsulates a lot of different you know things that are happening. One is this concept of wanting to extend the cloud into an on-prem data center. And we see a lot of that, you know, especially with our banking clients or in the financial services industries. There may be a reason due to compliance or regulation where you, know, you have to run that workload in an on-prem or in a specific country or location. And this concept of bringing the cloud into a um, on-prem location is one of the first uh, client problems that we really wanted to tackle and was one that came up over and over again. But distributed cloud really doesn't stop there. That's more of a hybrid use case if you kind of go with the Gartner definition. Um, then there's also this multi-cloud use case, which is like, okay, I, you've got some on-prem work workloads, but what about I've got workloads in all these different clouds? You know, a lot of our clients are already using five to eight different clouds. So 
what happens then? Can you span um, lots of different public clouds? And so that's more of a multi-cloud use case. So if you can do both hybrid, multi-cloud, and then also edge, that's where distributed cloud comes in. And I think that that's really where we're seeing that our clients um, fall into that category of a mix. Like they want to be able to pick and choose. Maybe some workloads are on-prem, some are on the edge, and some are on other public clouds. And that's where we're finding is you know really important for the clients that we speak to. Fascinating. Now, this cloud space, it just keeps on changing. It seems like every day it, it takes a new shape. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what IBM is doing specifically in this space of distributed cloud. Now IBM has a product that it's recently launched in this space. And I know your team has been working on it quite a bit. It's called the IBM Cloud Satellite. So can you tell us a little bit more specifically about that product? Absolutely. So we built out um, IBM Cloud Satellite. It's really an extension of the IBM Cloud. And so what we found is that our clients, you know, we gave the on-prem example as, as one, you know, maybe you're a banking client and you have an incubation team inside of a bank or financial services company. And you know, you're trying to build new apps every day, or you're trying to build new features for your clients. You want to consume cloud but you don't want to have to, you know, you don't want to have to install and manage and patch and upgrade all of the different software that goes into the services that you want to consume. You just want to consume as if it's in a public cloud, but you need it in a specific location. And so I think that is the concept. It's this concept of extending the public cloud. And I, I think for, at first we thought it was really about Kubernetes, that people just wanted to be able to consume Kubernetes as a service. At IBM, our flavor of Kubernetes is OpenShift. But um, you know, I, I we found out it's more than that. It's the IBM Cloud. It's all of the public cloud services that they want extended into all of these locations, whether it's on-prem, on the edge, or on other public clouds. And I think that's key. It's like having an easy consumption model so that that users can just invent. They don't have to think so much and build and kind of start from scratch. And they're not having to worry about all of the operational tasks that come with keeping workloads um, updated. So I think that's really the key um, problem we were solving with IBM Cloud Satellite. And so essentially it is the IBM Cloud distributed in all of these different locations. Okay, now now this may sound like a silly question, but just, but just to clarify, um, can you run non-IBM workloads on the IBM Cloud Satellite? Absolutely. And so, you know, IBM Cloud, you know, any of the any of the software that we have at IBM or even custom software, your own software can run on a plat on, you know, OpenShift on in any of the um, IBM Cloud satellite locations. So it's essentially a platform that allows you to run as we, we can run that service as a service for you. But then you can add on, you know, software either from the IBM Cloud catalog or from your own custom catalog. Or, you know, I think what's, what we're seeing a lot that's happening is having this consistent platform across all these locations really lends itself very nicely to automation. So there might be custom automation that you want to have across all these locations that you can now have time to implement because everything is being managed in a consistent way. So those are some of the things that we're seeing emerge in an in a, um, operational model like this. So just one more question before we bring Greg on. How do you see companies actually using the IBM Cloud Satellite product? Or is it so new out there that no one's actually using it yet? In that case, what would you see as, as an ideal use case for it? Oh, yeah. So we're getting, you know, this is what's so fascinating is that every day we're finding new use cases that are coming into play. And it's interesting. Um, I One of my favorite things is talking to clients because every day I hear a new problem that we could essentially solve with satellite. And so a couple of, um, you know, use cases, one of my favorite, this is, you know, uh, one that I've told a lot and I really enjoy is this concept of worker safety at the edge. And so we built an app. It's a very, you know, standard application where you, um, you have a satellite location at the office building edge. And essentially the satellite location runs OpenShift as a service, but also um, some video analytics software, some um, uh, device application software, which allows you to control all the video cameras in a building and analyze the data. And that application can then see if you're walking into a construction area and you're not wearing a hard hat. And why that's really interesting is that you want to be able to um, compute all of that data at the edge. You don't want to have to wait for it to go all the way back to a public cloud to be processed. 
You want all of those, compli- you know, all that compute to happen right at the edge. And you don't want to have any latency because if you warn someone too late, they could essentially get hurt. You know, um, that's really not what you're after. So we've done some partnerships with uh, Lumen in particular um, around fiber, which makes the latency near zero. And so you can do all of the analytics at the edge and you can, um, you know, introduce near zero latency. And then what it's what my favorite part about the whole thing is that what is happening is you're able to consume cloud native best practices. So let's say that the use case needs to change suddenly. And in our case, it changed because of COVID. So, you know, here we are in our home offices, but, um, you know, we had to change because now it's not, you know, about hard hats, it's about masks. Are you wearing the mask correctly? And it's also about thermal devices. Maybe you need to hook up thermal devices to take temperatures. So we're able to change that use case in a matter of days instead of months or you know longer because we're not having to start from scratch. We're not having to manually install all of the software and manage it. We're just consuming cloud as it's meant to be consumed in a very cloud native way, but at the edge. So those are one of my favorites, um, but there's so many different, you know, use cases I hear every day and I learn something new every single day from my clients. And I think that's what makes it uh, the most rewarding is to hear these you know, problems and say, huh, I think we might be able to solve that. That's that's probably my favorite part about the job. Wow. I love that safety use case of using the satellite for edge computing, because as we all know, the edge is really the next iteration of where we're all heading. Now we're going to pivot to the second half of our show. Let's recap. So far, we've learned about this new category of distributed cloud. And we've also learned a little bit about the IBM Cloud Satellite product that enables that type of distributed cloud architecture. So now let's bring in Greg Hodgkinson, our CTO at Prolifix, so we can talk a little bit more specifically about how this approach would work in real live situations with real live teams. Greg. Welcome to the Sandbox. Thanks very much, Kirsten, and great to be here with Brianna as well. Well, obviously, Greg, you're no stranger to the Sandbox. It's great to have you on as a guest. So, Greg, let's start with what the audience has been waiting to hear about. This idea of a walled garden as it relates to the cloud. Now, I do want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. You came up with this comparison, and I know it's related to flexibility. So tell us a little bit more about what you're thinking when you came up with that. Yeah, so it almost immediately struck me. I mean, so the, you know, I haven't come up with the term wall garden that's generally used out there, but what it's normally meant to, to describe is a closed ecosystem. We all know a garden's a great place to be, you know, if you doesn't love experiencing and hanging out in the garden, but a wall garden kind of brings this idea of being trapped or limited in some way. And at some point, it doesn't matter how lovely the garden is, you need to step outside. So the concept of the wall garden has often been used to describe some of the big software players, uh, to mention Apple and Google. And it's been suggested that they try and keep you inside their ecosystem um, by making it hard or impossible to move outside without giving up some of the things that attracted you inside the ecosystem in the first place. So if we apply that idea to the public cloud, we all know what attracts you to the public cloud is this ability to consume software as a service, this flexibility and speed, um, and that, you know, the the public cloud absolutely delivers on that promise. We know you can deliver things quickly in a cloud. You provision a service at the click of a button. It's flexible. You can scale it up. You can scale it down as, as you need it. But then you read the fine prints, and that is that the service that you're consuming in the cloud can only run as a workload in that public cloud. Now, that doesn't sound very flexible to me, but you then realize there's the, you know, again, that ease of use that brought you into the cloud, you're now stuck running those workloads inside that public cloud. So you're losing out some of your flexibility and some options. So in some cases, that's fine. Um, you know, there are classes of application that are okay with running inside that walled garden, but for most you know, significant, um, I'd say enterprise software that's being built out there, um, and you, you heard some of those examples that Brianna was speaking about. The consuming the service inside the walled garden, you know, that you, you don't want to be giving up the option of true flexibility, which is again running that service wherever you want to. Okay, great. And of course, in today's world, no one is committed to one technology. So the ability to mix and match what's in your environment 
is really critical. And being able to extend that to your cloud architecture just, it seems to make a lot of sense. Now I do have a little bit of a technical question for you, Greg. Clouds, when I think of the cloud, I, I typically think of a cloud running as a service. So can you talk a little bit about what that means, especially in this context of a cloud satellite type of technology? Yeah, and so Brianna touched on this. I mean, so when you're consuming software as a service, there's a whole host of things you don't need to worry about anymore. So you don't need to worry about installing and operating that software. You don't need to worry about upgrading it. You don't need to worry about ensuring that it's got enough compute resource or disk resource. Uh, you don't need to worry about applying fixed packs. And you know we've really grown up having to worry about those things as soon as you want to run a platform or software because we used to installing that on premise. Um, you move to the cloud, and now you, you know, there's a whole host of responsibilities that you can give up. So firstly, that frees up um, resource time or, or your, your people time, and your people can focus their time elsewhere. But also, it's a massive reduction in risk because, again, with all those things I've just mentioned, the, the operational needs, um, if you don't tend to that software that you've installed, if you don't apply the latest fix packs, if you don't you know, look after the resource uh, requirements, if you don't look after that over time, um, that's a major risk because you could have downtime. And as soon as you're consuming services or software as a service in the cloud, again, you don't have to worry about any of those issues anymore. So, you know, from my point of view, you want your team to focus on the software that you're writing on top of platforms. You don't want your team to be focused on operating those platforms themselves. Okay. So, Brianna, I'm going to go back over to you for a moment. Let's talk about the concept of application modernization. So Prolifix works with a lot of companies undertaking application modernization initiatives. And I know you gave an example earlier, that great video type of use case for safety. Are you seeing clients using cloud satellite technology in support of an application modernization initiative? What a great question. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I think it touched on it touches on what what Greg said about flexibility and as a service. And so I think most uh, clients have, you know, their goal is really to get everything to the cloud, but it's a process, right? And so it may not happen in, you know, the next six months, next year, or even five years, you know, and they need the flexibility to be able to you know, uh, move workloads to the cloud as it makes sense for them. And it may be that there's a microservice that one needs to move to the cloud, but the rest of the workload stays, you know, in an on-prem situation for a while. It may be the dev test is in the cloud, but everyone needs and is looking for the maximum amount of flexibility. And then that, if they have flexibility, it makes modernization really, it gives the client control to really modernize on their own terms in the way that works for their own, you know, timelines and budgets and their own roadmaps instead of being constrained. And so I think that's a big key, you know, is that we feel that pain. I mean, we're a hundred year old uh, a tech company. So if anyone understands the pain of modernization, it's us. And I think approaching this problem with empathy has made all of the difference because we understand there's gonna you're making progress, but there may be steps along the way that constrain you. And if there's any way that we can make that a little easier, that's something that's really special to us, right? And so I think that with application modernization, it's all about figuring out what's gonna make the biggest impact. And a lot of times we find that the workloads either new or that are most client facing really make more sense to move to the cloud first. And then some of the other workloads, it might be okay to stay where they are for a while. And then you can kind of move them and upgrade them and change them as it suits you. So I think that's a big, um, a big lesson that we've seen. Um, then there's also security and controls. And one of the most popular questions I get is, you know, when can I get the FS cloud controls with satellite? Because, you know, folks really want to extend the compliance and security controls that we have in the FS cloud at IBM, but they want those extended into all of these locations. So that's a big um, thing that I hear a lot, especially with modernization, because that, that security and control and compliance is so critical. Um, and so those actual controls will be flowed into um, satellite in Q3 of this year. So it's something really top of mind that we're working on today. So that, that's kind of how, those are the, some of the kind of pain points and you know our philosophy on how to address is to really meet our clients where they are and, and help them modernize. And you'd be surprised at the, th the really interesting things that folks are up to, whether it's um, a lot of interesting things with um, microservices and you know maybe it's 
you know, I had one client ask, you know, could we predict where a workload should run based on a network or, or bandwidth availability? And we, we actually can do that. You know, it's not sci-fi. It's not, you know, 10 years down the road. I mean, that's something that we could utilize like a service mesh like Istio for. So it is all kinds of really neat problems that we can solve. And I think it, it just comes with, you know, building a solution that is most flexible. Okay. Now, Greg, I want to ask you to add on to that. You talk to customers all the time who are doing cloud and application modernization initiatives. Do you have anything to add to what Brianna just said or, or stories that you'd like to share? Well, I sort of follow on from what Brianna said, which is that the application modernization is all about moving, firstly, but moving to those uh, services and platforms and architectures that are going to help you get the most out of the cloud. So the most out of the flexibility and most out of the speed. That's the whole point of modernizing your applications is to make again, the, the most use out of that cloud environment. Um, and, and again, that's great. And for some applications, just the cloud itself is fine for you because you don't mind being limited to that wall garden. So, you know, organizations literally, when they're moving to the cloud, they've got a portfolio of things they need to move. Uh, and they'll, they'll rank and they'll make certain decisions on whether to either rewrite or replatform, um, you know, depending on the specific application. And again, some of the applications you're fine with just maybe rewriting cloud native um, on a new platform. Um, and, and then you can consume that platform as a service in the public cloud, and that's all good. But as soon as you start talking about more kind of enterprise scale applications, more interesting use cases, um, where the data is incredibly relevant, and data is a key part of why I'm excited about the solution, um, then you don't want the decision to consume your platforms, your services, uh, and the architectures of the cloud as a service. You don't want that to force you to run your, your software in a specific location. You want to keep that flexibility. That's exactly what cloud satellites bring. Okay, great. Now, finally, I know that IBM, they, they really aren't the only player in this space. They're not the only option for this kind of technology. Um, I'm not going to put Brianna in the awkward spot to talk about her competition, but I will ask Greg. Greg, how does the IBM cloud satellite product compare to other similar options out there? Now, I know I'm setting you up being that Brianna's right here, but why don't you take a stab at that? <laughs> I, would, I would absolutely be you know, very polite with Brianna, um, but we should obviously say that other brands do exist. <laughs> you know, every other cloud, every other major cloud provider is looking, is getting into the space, the whole distributed cloud space. Um, I would say that the there's two reasons, I think, two main reasons that um, is making the IBM solution very compelling. The first, of the, the first is that it's a software, it's a solution that only requires you to, it, it's not locked into a specific class of, of infrastructure. It's pretty much commodity hardware that you can use because it's a software only solution. You know, cloud satellite gets laid down on your infrastructure as a location, you plug that into a location and you don't need to buy specific hardware from IBM um, there was a time when IBM would have loved to have sold you loads of hardware, but you know that, that's not the IBM of today. You don't need to buy any specific hardware from them. Um, they're not even forcing you to buy a specific class of hardware from some you know set of hardware vendors that they've given their blessing to. It's literally commoditized hardware that probably already exists in your data center um, that you can repurpose, plug into cloud satellites, um, and you know you start getting all of these benefits of as a service in your infrastructure, wherever you want. I think that's the, one of the, the key reasons I find it compelling. The other one is that if you look at the set of services that can be laid out on top of cloud satellites, you know, Brian has mentioned a few of those. I'm just going to talk about three. OpenShift, first of all. I mean, with OpenShift, you have got the you know, world-class leading container platform um, and who isn't moving their applications to run as a set of containers nowadays? Um, so OpenShift is incredibly relevant um, to, to most organizations' future platform needs. With Cloud Satellite, what you're getting is the ability to take OpenShift, consume it as a service wherever you want to. So that could be in your data center. Again, 
OpenShift itself, you could today um, get a whole bunch of machines, you know, format them, set up a cluster. Um, the, you're going to then need some dedicated OpenShift administrators that are you know, going to do that installation, that are going to tend to the cluster for you, that are going to go plug in nodes, look after the infrastructure, upgrades, fix packs, all of those things we've said we don't like doing anymore. So the other option is cloud satellite. You now have OpenShift as a service that you basically click provision anywhere you want to, on premise, at the edge. Um, so that opens up massive po possibilities. So you know, if I just stop there, that should be reason enough. But then you add on the cloud packs um, with their specialized workloads so, you know, for automation, data, integration, security. You know, th this is the future platform for consuming those more kind of business um, focused uh, platforms. Uh, and then lastly, what we're finding is, you know, Brianna mentioned this very briefly as well, the whole banking grade security that you get with the FS Cloud, you know, to be able to consume that as a service wherever you want to, is it's just quite incredible. So I think for, if you put those two key things together, the, the ability to use pretty much any hardware um, with just a software footprint, as well as all of the services that this allows you to lay out on that infrastructure, then it starts adding up to pretty competing solutions. All right, guys, with that, I'm getting the wrap signal. So we need to move on to Q&A. Now, again, to our audience, if you have a question, just type it into that live chat. It's going to be on the right or the bottom of your screen. All right, let's take a look at those questions we've got. Oh, good, we've got some uh, some really good ones coming in here. Let's. Let's start with, actually, let's do a quick time check. We've only got about four minutes left, so we will need to answer these questions rather quickly, uh, Greg. So, um, <laughs> all right, let's start with this one. Um, what type of workloads are ideal for this type of technology? So I, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push that to Brianna. Absolutely. So I think, you know, it, it's interesting. I think that satellite or distributed cloud model can uh, be a great thing for lots of different kinds of workloads, especially I find the workloads that are closest to your user, the ones that your users are going to consume and use the most often are the ones that you want to change and iterate very quickly. So I think that, that they typically benefit the most from cloud native best practices. Um, but also there could be workloads that are really, um, uh, they have high regulatory constraints. So maybe they need to live in a specific country due to regulation. So I think that, you know, the, the, the workloads that are closest to your user um, are great candidates, but also those, those really high compliant and regulatory uh, type of workloads. Okay, great. Greg, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, you, give, you give me a chance here. I mean, I guess it's not as much the workloads themselves because cloud satellite can, it's pretty much any, any workload would be suitable to run a cloud satellite. It's really what's around the workload. So it's do you want to run this workload next to something else that's either on-premise or at the edge or in another cloud um, that's more of a factor than the workloads themselves. I mean, as we know, applications today are made up of all kinds of workloads and, and pretty much without exception, they're all suitable to run on cloud okay. satellite. So actually, that's a great transition to another question that's in here is about the edge. So, Greg, I'm going to stay with you for a second. How does how does this approach accelerate deploying workloads at the edge? For example, the 5G enabled workload at like a manufacturing plant. So the fantastic and Brianna told a good uh, story earlier um, about your know, was very similar to that use case. But the fantastic thing about um, 5G and where cloud satellite comes in is 5G gives you that near, you know, instantaneous um, ability to have, um, you know, devices in an area connecting with workloads. Uh, so you want to get those workloads really close to the edge near those devices so you can make the most of that really instantaneous connection. Um, but the thing is, again, so as soon as you're putting workloads outside of the cloud, you've got to install software and you've got to upgrade. So all, you know, we've discussed all that before. Bring all of that goodness of software as a service, put it at the edge. And what that means to 5G is if you've got a 5G project, um, all of those benefits of speed and flexibility that you get from the public cloud, you now get right there near your, you know, near your, your devices at the edge. Um, so it can really be a, a critical factor in accelerating those projects. Okay. So Brianna, do you want to add anything on to that or did he cover it? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, Greg always covers it. But I think that this concept of, you know, by use case, if you know, whether it's, you know, worker safety or maybe it's a, a manufacturing use case where you're looking to find, you know, a defect or a problem in the assembly line or, you know, you need an instantaneous uh, feedback. So you need to have a low latency environment. And that's where, you know, this, this concept of edge and 5G really comes to life. Okay, great. Now, if, um, all right, so one more question here. If I want to work with the IBM cloud satellite product, uh, should I work with IBM directly or should I work with Prolifix? How, how do you guys work together for something like this? So um, actually, Brianna, I'm going to start with you and then let Greg pitch in. Yeah, I mean, Prolifix is such an amazing partner of ours. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of our um, our customers come to Prolifix and, you know, get everything they need, you know, and I think that that's wonderful. And, you know, having experts that really understand how these technologies work and how they come together is is fantastic. So, of course, you can go to IBM, but I think, you know, using a partner like Prolifix is really fantastic because you can get that, um, you know, you can get that expertise that Prolifix provides. Okay. Any final words there, Greg, before we wrap? Yes, yeah, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I mean, the what you're getting with IBM as a vendor, what we have in common, I guess, is we're both trying to help our clients on the app modernization journey. So that's definitely our, our point of commonality. Our, our slightly different focus is obviously we're coming in as systems integrators. And as a systems integrator, we can bring to bear um, expertise. You know, Cloud Satellite's gonna be one component of a larger solution that may involve other clouds, um, that may involve other technologies. And as a systems integrator, we can bring to bear the, the skills required to bring all those things together in the solution. But also we have, you know, as a systems integrator, we have a consulting team that's able to help at a strategic level and do the workshops for the customer to understand their context, the outcomes they're looking to drive, and then put in place a strategy um, that, will, that will contextualize Cloud Satellite. I mean, Cloud Satellite is a piece of technology we're using it to meet some business needs. And that is exactly the way we engage with our customers is driving those strategic conversations, helping the customer move from that to a roadmap to POC. So you want to do those two things quickly. Think about the strategy, but also let's do a POC. And that's where our innovation center can jump in, deliver something quickly uh, to prove the value again with some context that, that will allow the customer to better figure out how this can add benefits to their business. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Greg. And whoever it was that put that last question in, um, I think we need to talk. So uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll be looking to uh, to have that conversation with you. So, but it does look like that is all the time we have. We're actually over by just a couple of minutes, but we really appreciate everybody sticking with us. Um, and Greg and Brianna, thank you so much for taking time to come and play in the prolific sandbox. Um, now, Brianna, as a thank you, we have a fun little gift for you. So can we put this up on the screen? Oh, I can't it's wait. A, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a caricature of you in the prolific sandbox. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't wait to see it. Yes. So now you're going to get both a soft copy and also one in the mail. Okay, Wonderful. so you can... Add that to your signature block, whatever you want to do with it. I will. I'm so honored. And, you know, it's it's really so wonderful to work with Prolifix. It's so interesting how you all just understood what we were trying to do and the problems we're trying to solve so early. And it was so special. And so I really, I've drug Greg into many, you know, speaking engagements with me because he just gets it and he really understands, you know, the as a service. Uh, benefits and that's been really fantastic to work with you all so I really appreciate it and thank you for being such an amazing partner um, in this journey. Well thank you and thank you for the partnership I'm sure Greg would say the same but we're gonna wrap <laughs> so I'm gonna speak for Greg there. So to our audience thank you so much for stopping by we love having you here and be sure to come back Thursday April 15th at the same time because on that one we're going to be discussing healthcare interoperability because there's some changes happen there, right? So we're going to be talking about what's changing and how different organizations are preparing for that. Now, even if you're not in healthcare, some of the patterns and the themes around the whole topic of interoperability and what that means from a data perspective, um, as well as integration with external parties, all of these things are a part of interoperability. 
those topics are very applicable to, to most large businesses today. So even if you're not in healthcare, be sure to sign up, join us for next Thursday, and get some ideas on how you can use interoperability to drive your next wave of innovation. So until then, keep well and keep innovating.